hand. Okay, hopefully that's all right with everyone. Um, okay, we'll try the auto transcript as well. All right, uh, if anyone else comes in late or anything, they can post in the chat, I'll keep that open so I've got an eye on it. Uh, so as I said, what we're going to focus on in this session is looking at specifically the research record and the skills for the assignment set by Mark Draper on the LPC. Any questions, any problems, just let me know as we go. So the first thing I'm going to do is start a screen share so we can all have nice dignified shots of my face squinting at things. Okay. Okay, so what we're doing, looking a little bit specifically at how the library can help you with this assignment. So looking at research skills, we're gonna talk a lot about the research record or what it should look like, what should be in it, what shouldn't be in it, how that functions. And then we'll have a bit of a look at Lexis PSL, um, which is the corporate version of Lexis. So Lexis library is aimed more at academics and aimed at um, students. Lexis PSL tends to be what you might encounter if you actually, well, when you actually go and work as a lawyer. Another version of this is Practical Law Company, which is the professional version of West Law, but we only have PSL at the moment. We'll also briefly touch on referencing and where you can get help for that. As I was saying, I'm recording this now. You're obviously welcome to unmute at any point if you've got any questions, if anything is going wrong, or you can post them in the chat. Oops. Um, there's just me here, so um, if you post it in the chat and I've managed to not notice it, you can also use the little um, react buttons and put your hand up and I will stop and double check things. Right, I hope that's fine, let's get started. So, for this assignment, you will be set a problem by Michael in the LPC and you will be expected to produce a memorandum answering the problem, a research record and a bibliography. So the things you're gonna be assessed on is diagnosing the client problem from the, the sample letter you've received, the sources that you use, so making sure that you have done thorough research, that you've used authoritative sources, you've used things that you could rely on in court. Um, you'll be assessed on how you've provided a solution and how you've communicated. Um, and the vast majority of that is skills that you will be learning through your degree, but we can help um, on finding sources and dealing with the aspects to do with research. Um, so kind of the quick disclaimer, why worry about research? Everything's on Google. Um, well, obviously at this point, I hope you're already starting to realize that Google is a very good resource if you want to know what film is on in the town you're on that evening, but it's not very good for academic research and it's particularly not good for legal research because Google searches so broadly, it can't, it's going to bring in results that the largest number of people want. The largest number of people tend to want a basic explainer, which is why Wikipedia always features so high. It's not necessarily going to retrieve legal information in the same way. It's also very, very hard to filter and refine. Even if you're using Google Scholar, a lot of tools are missing. But also really crucially, you have chosen to go into a profession where your research skills are part of your core professional skills. And that includes using the databases. The databases we use here, the resources we use here will be available to you in various ways in your professional life. So the skills you learn in using to and learning to use them now will carry through into your professional life. So it's actually not just a skill to benefit you while you're at university, it is a core skill for the rest of your profession. Um, so the part we're really focusing on today is those research skills and looking at the research record. And the research record is a really key part of your assignment. It is also another aspect of the professional skill. When you are practicing as a lawyer and you are asked perhaps by someone senior at your firm to research, you will be expected to keep a research record. I'm just going to make a quick apology. Um, I sadly am sharing a room with my washing machine, which has hit the spin cycle. I really apologize. I hope that's not, um, I hope that's not causing too much interference in terms of you guys being able to hear things. So 
The research record is very literally what it sounds like. It is a record of exactly what you're doing with research. It should record exactly where you went, any what keywords you used, what filters you used, what sections you clicked into, and how long that took you. And it needs to be really accurate so that if in your professional life, something's happened to you, maybe you become sick, maybe you're pulled onto another project, someone else can come along, look at the research record, see exactly what you've done and pick up the train of your thinking without any lost time. Um, so what should be in this research record? Every single source that you cite in your bibliography should be there. An accurate time record of time spent. So this again, I think is one where students can feel quite inclined to go, oh, I'm really clever and I did it really quickly. Doing it really quickly isn't the point of the research record. It takes the time it takes. And again, that links to professional time. So your research record will go into your billable hours when you're working. Um, so it is part of that being accurate about what you're doing. Um, for every time, everything you do, you should be recording the information sources. So where you're in Westlaw, where you're in LexisNexis, Nexus, Lexis PSL, whatever. Um, and what keywords did you use? It's also useful to list what topics you're focusing on. When we get to Lexis PSL, you'll see that it very much focuses on practice areas rather than say Westlaw or Lexis um, Library, which is more of an overview of the law. So it's worth noting what practice areas you were working in and focusing on, especially if your topic moves between practice areas, which can happen. Michael tends to set problems that focus on housing and property, I assume he'll do that again. I'll keep my examples largely in employment simply so that I'm not duplicating anything. The next part of the research record, you should evaluate what you've done. So just a quick note of the search was good, the search was helpful, and what you're going to do next with the information you've retrieved. So it is a case of just recording all that thought process in a clear and logical manner. Um, it has to be present to pass the assignment. Often students are tem tempted to edit it or not include it. It needs to be there. Um, and one of the reasons it needs to be there is if you get the wrong answer, if they're not happy with your response to the problem, you can nevertheless pick up marks because your re research record will show your thinking. It will show how you came up with your answer. And it also makes it easier should you have got the wrong answer for the lecturer to feedback to you and go, well, here's where you went the wrong way. Here's where we go must follow a clear set formula. I don't know if he has. Sometimes you're given examples of the research record. I've got a form that I'll show you guys as we go along, which is a way of doing it. But basically, you need a really clear method of listing all of this and just repeating it over and over again. Um, that evaluation is still really key. It doesn't have to be long, but just sort of a jotting down of what terms worked, what terms didn't. Um, and you should also highlight where you've hit dead ends, where you use something and it's proved the wrong line of inquiry. Again, that might seem quite counterintuitive because you're never going to write an essay where you go, and I thought about this thing, but actually this was completely wrong. It's really useful in this because, again, it shows how you're thinking about the topic, how, it how you developed your own understanding and where you went. But also, perhaps something you discount as a dead end shouldn't have been discounted as a dead end and it shows where you got to and where perhaps you got knocked off your course. The other thing to bear in mind is research is full of dead ends. It's very unusual for you to look at a question, retrieve exactly the right words, put exactly the right things in the key search and retrieve everything you need. It's very, very rare. So don't be worried about recording those kind of dead ends. And again, it, your research record should be really long. For every search you you do every document you interact with you should be listing it and recording how you got there any questions about any of this so far okay i'm gonna have to do a lot of assuming that you're all right because you've all got your cameras off which is absolutely fine just slightly adds to the feeling you're talking to yourself okay so this is my example of a way you can format it you can download this off the law library guide i will show you where or you can use something that's closer to examples Michael has provided or whatever makes sense to you. But what you can see here is if I was doing my research record, I would start by recording my topic. I would say what keywords I'm using, where I'm searching, and then what I'm doing. So have I gone into case law? Have I selected particular filters? 
what have I done, summarize what I found, and then talk about whether I'm happy with my search and what I'm going to do next. And then I would just repeat that for every single search until I was done. So these are the slides that I have uh, borrowed from Michael over the years as a sort of extra hammering home his key points. The common mistakes, not understanding the task. So do make sure when this is assigned to you that you take a bit of time before you even start researching to really read it through and be really clear in your mind what you're doing. Um, not explaining your research and relating it to the client. Again, this is where you found the information, but you haven't tailored it to their problem. This exercise is pretend you're a lawyer and you're working for this person so it needs to be related um not using both paper and electronic sources this one i think is perhaps a little out of date these days a lot of our paper sources are not being as updated as regularly as they used to be and you may not be in the library at the moment depending on how you're feeling about coming on campus covid etc cetera, etc cetera. what i would rephrase that as as i think when I think about it, is making sure you're comprehensive. You're just using one database. If you're not trying other things, you might not be capturing everything. So have an incomplete research record. So again, we've, we've really hammered this at this point, but it should record absolutely everything. Dead ends, searches where you made mistakes, whatever. Someone should be able to come along and reconstruct the process that you've been through. Um, and treating it as an academic exercise. So I think this is the other thing that's a bit unusual about the research record when you come to this point is in academic essays, you're often kind of hiding the work. You've done this research, you've done this thinking, you've hit your deadlines, and then what you're showing is this beautiful polished essay. The research record is you showing the legwork and that's what it's meant to be. All right. So, the other part of this is your bibliography. So this is different to your research record because while the research record is everything that you've looked at, the bibliography should only be the sources that you've actually used to answer the question. Um, it should be formatted using Oscula. We'll touch a little bit on Oscula and where you can get help with that. And you should group them by type. So all your cases should be together, all your legislation should be together each in their own subheading and then your secondary materials should be together if you need any help with referencing any questions about that you can always contact the library by email or you can book an appointment with us um, the other thing and this is my new piece of advice from michael from this year um, the answer to the question must be in the memorandum that you've written and you should use the question to help formulate subheadings within the memorandum so addressing the parts of the problem as subheadings um, the answer needs to be clear there. The research trail should be the record of how you got to the answer. The memorandum should really clearly lay out your answer. Any questions about any of that? Okay, everyone's still happy? Good. Um, be careful. This is just, again, a reminder of good practice when you're noting things. Make sure that when you're taking notes, you know where you're getting things from. So page numbers when you're quoting print sources, the publication details, web addresses. Um, and make sure that you're not, as I think can be quite common these days, reading something, copy and pasting it into a Word document and then forgetting where you've got it from. Again, that can tie in quite neatly with the formal process of doing the research record and evaluating it, making sure you've captured everything you need for a proper bibliography. The other thing you need to keep in mind is making sure you use authoritative sources. Um, so um, in terms of legal sources, what's authoritative is you're looking at things like statute, you're looking at case law that has been upheld, not overturned or modified, and you're looking at sources like Halsbury's Laws, the key commentary, that one's in Lexis Library. Um, when we look at Lexis PSL, you'll see there's lots of material in there that has been produced by lawyers, such as practice notes and overview information, which can be really useful, it's really going to help you develop your thinking, but it's only the thoughts of a practitioner. It's not authoritative. It would not stand up in court. And so while you can use that to develop your thinking, I wouldn't be citing it in the memorandum because it's not authoritative. Okay, so where can you find information? I'm hoping that you guys have already had a look at the Law Library Guide. Um, I'm just gonna leave the slide up for now. Actually, I'm not, I'm gonna a new share for a minute. Um, there we go. 
So the idea of the Law Library Guide is just to break down the information chunk by chunk by chunk. So you've got law books here. So this is focused more on our online collections, but also collections within the library, journal articles, finding cases. If you're not quite sure what you're looking for. Key resources can be a really useful one, useful one to go to because this is picking up a lot of really key areas to go and have a look. Um, again, if you're needing help, all our contact details are on here. Um, and the research method record form I used if you want to have a look at mine or adapt that for your own use is somewhere on this how to page there we go so it's there on the how to page you can download it it's probably not going to show up now I've done that um, you can download it and have a look at that in your own time adapt it to your own purpose okay I'm just gonna go back to my powerpoint no questions so far so I hope this is all useful and clear okay so again just a quick overview of sources if you're double click there if you're looking for journal articles you're looking at west law uk you're looking at lexus journals which is in lexus library um you're looking at hein online you can look within ifind as well um but remember of course that these are not an authoritative primary source they are commentary on the law so again they can be really useful for helping you develop your understanding but they probably are not going to be sources you would rely on in the memorandum responding. Um, cases are authoritative. Again, good places to be looking is Westlaw UK, Lexis Library or Lexis PSL. We'll have a look at both of those. Um, have any of you come across Bailey, which is the third um, item on the list? So this is a free site that indexes UK cases. It's a really good resource to use. You might use it if you go into practice at a firm which is struggling for money for the databases. It's also really good um, when you're job hunting because it allows you to search within your topic and keep up to date on what's going on. Um, so well worth having a look at and getting used to. Um, we're, we're the always, sorry, stumbling over my words there. Always with cases, make sure you are checking whether they've been upheld or overturned within the databases. That's usually the traffic light, light system. So red for overturned, amber for mixed treatment and green for upheld. So statute law, again, this is a primary authoritative source. You'll be expected to refer to statute in this. Um, you can get them in West Law, you can get Halsby's Laws, which is commentary on the laws of England and Wales. Um, so you can have a look at that within Lexis. Um, Legislation.gov.uk is your free site. Government sites can be a bit of a nightmare to search. They like to change links and mess around with things whenever they get a new minister. But again, well worth a look at because it's something you can use if you're not currently employed or at the university to keep up to date and keep your head in. Um, again, make sure you're looking for authority. So I've got a list here of the most authoritative law reports here. So Chancery, Family Division, Queen's Branch, and so on. So make sure you're checking all of that. And that kind of goes into looking at whether a case has been upheld, overturned, how it's been treated subsequent, subsequently. So make sure you're keeping an eye on all of that. Okay, so that's kind of my big whistle stop tour of sources and everything that goes into the research record and what it should look like. Before we move on to starting to think about research, is there any questions about any of that so far? Okay, you all seem quite happy with that. Great. Um, so what I want to do um, and I know there's only a few of you, so this might not be the easiest, is I want to do an exercise in how you think about keywords. So often when you come to an essay, you will see the word, you'll see a question, you'll see the note, you'll circle one or two keywords and you'll take them straight to a database. So what I want you to try and do for a thought exercise is using the chat, I'd just like you to post what you can see in my image, just words to describe what you can see if you can uh, indulge me on that one. So I'll just give you guys a minute. It's not a trick question, literally just say what you can see. Fruit, thank you very much, Gemma. Bananas, fantastic. Just keep going, a few, few example prices, yep. 
mark it, fantastic. One or two more just to let me make my point. <laughs> People, yep. All right, we'll, we'll leave it there because it's a bit awkward with, with few numbers and you having to type. Okay, so the idea of this, I said that when you come to your memorandum, when you come to an essay question, often your search proce processes, and without thinking about it in depth, you tend to sort of read your question, read your problem, loop a couple of words in your mind and go straight to the databases and plug them, plug them in. So the idea of this is suggesting that before you do that, before you even start your research record, it's actually worth taking a bit of time to think of it more abstractly, like a picture, and trying to describe and think about alternatives. So if I go back to you guys helping me out in the chat, the first one, and it's almost always the first one, is fruit. So that is obviously a big area of fruit. It then gets broken down in the next comment straight away into a smaller area, bananas. I once had somebody start listing banana varietals, which was very surprising. Didn't know anything about banana varietals before that. So that's breaking it down into even more specific areas. Um, my next comment in the chat from Harriet was about prices. So in that case, it's starting to look at a related issue. So you've got the, the issue of fruit and you've got the issue of prices. Fionn then took it up to a top level because she said market. Um, so the idea of all, and then Harriet introduced a third topic because she put in people. Um, and so the idea of all of that is it's looking at everything you're being asked for. What are all the topics this is touching in? What are the smaller terms that might underline that? What are the bigger issues on top of it? And sometimes people get really niche with this. So recently I've had people point out that some of the people in the background are wearing scarves. So a really small tangential issue. I've also had people notice that the foreground of the image is an independent trading market schools store but in the background you can actually see a supermarket so you've got different issues that can draw out there so the idea of this to relate it back to you is when you get your problem set when you're looking at it take that time to read it to really understand it and to think of all the different ways you can express the problem the different practice areas the different issues it may take touch on how it breaks down into small pieces and what it builds up to big um, the other thing that this allows me to do, which is basically librarian bad humor, is it allows me to point out that you also need to be careful of your search terms because words can straddle meanings. This is less of an issue in law because you tend to be so focused in legal databases that you will find that there are terms that straddle practice areas. It might be useful to filter into a specific practice area depending on what you're doing. Um, the really cheesy example is there are apples in that picture, but if I search for apples, I'm very unlikely to get fruit. I'm much more likely to get the computer um, example. So it's just one more thing to think about when you're going to it, right? I hope that was a useful exercise. I see we made it to the half hour mark, so I'm just going to keep going unless there's any questions. So yeah, to summarize that, start with the key terms in your question. Think about the narrower and specific terms that might be relevant. Also think about the wider issues and topics. And whether you need to go narrower or wider will depend on a lot of things. It will depend on the structure of the question. It will depend on the results you're getting. Um, and that also feeds into that evaluation in your work record. Am I, am I too focused? Am I too broad? How can I narrow this? How can I broaden it over and over again as an evaluation? So I'll just put the chat in a weird place. Right, so Lexis PSL, I'm just gonna quickly tell you about it and then we're actually gonna look at it so this isn't completely death by PowerPoint. Um, so this is used in a lot of practices. It is the corporate end of Lexis um, and it tends to group information by field or topic. What we'll see in there is practice notes, cases, legislation, analysis, rules and guidelines. And it links to the Lexis library. So you've got full text for everything. And it's really, really good for keeping up to date. Um, it's also really good for this particular assignment in two different ways. Firstly, um, because it is something that's used in the professions. Um, but secondly, because it's really, really trying to help you. At every point, it's trying to make your searching as concise as possible. So I said I tend to do my examples in employment. So you can see that I've already got it in employment. 
If I click here in the practice area, you can see that we're subscribed to every possible practice area. So I can select one in particular, um, or I can just search where I am. Having selected my practice area, you can see it's also trying to help me by going, do I know what topics I'm in? So again, when you're coming to your question, if you knew, for example, that this was to do with sickness and absence, you'd be able to go straight there, not even bother searching. You can click through and see everything that's tagged under sickness and absence. You can see I've got a variety of practice notes, precedents, checklists, forms, and so on. I'm just going to go back a minute. Um, one other thing that can be useful to do is you can log in using your student email and create your own account. This means that you can save your information and it also means you can set up alerts. Might not be so useful for this particular assignment, but as you come to the end of your degree, as you're starting to apply for internships and for jobs, if you know you want to go into a particular field of law, you can set alerts up and keep up to date. Again, before we even start searching, if we scroll down a bit, Again, we've got this kind of push to help you. So they've got their key areas looking at COVID and Brexit. Let's leave both of those topics for another day. But if you scroll down again, you can see, again, we've got another where we're, we're listing topics. So you can start to look into topics without searching at all. You've got this news filter, which again, very useful when you're looking at developing professional awareness for internships or for, for jobs. Um, so it's looking at the latest information in this practice field with the ability to click through and subscribe. Key resources, again, is quite a useful one. So you can see a mix of toolkits addressing particular topics, documents that are most often used, which unsurprisingly, we've got a lot of settlement agreements in contract law. We've got coronavirus redundancy the kind of things you'd expect to see there, and also tools like calculators to help you calculate set settlements. Um, the final section in here is looking at international. So again, if you need that international perspective, it's trying to pull that out for you straight away. Um, the reason I'm focusing again on employment law is so that I don't accidentally infringe on anything you might do in your research. I can again look at my filters again here so I'm deliberately in employment but I could select all or I could select related areas depending on what I want so having talked you through all of that I'm going to actually try and run a search so I'm just going to go with harassment nice big broad topic well not nice but big and broad um, again you can see like a lot of databases now just at this point it's already trying to guess what I want so again, it's always worth taking a pause to see if anything that's there is worth using. Um, if not, you can just click straight through and run your search. Okay, so having gone into my field here, you can see I've got a quick definition of what harassment is there. And then I've got a range of different information. So I've got apt. So this again, would go back to the authoritative sources. Um, I can start using here to look for specific legislation. But I've also got a lot of practice notes coming up and precedents. So I'm going to go into the first practice note just to show you. Ooh. Well, at least I am, if Lexus. There we go. Um, just to show you what this is. The practice notes are maintained by lawyers employed by Lexus who are professionals in their field. Um, and what's useful about the practice notes is they're really good for starting to get to grips with a topic. Um, not great for citing, but really good for starting to get to grips. You can see we can jump to the different sections. You can also see that it's telling us what, what laws it's considering. So if I was reading this with no understanding of harassment at all, I could say, oh, okay, so we're looking at harassment under the Equality Act. Um, and at that point, I can click on the Equality Act. I'm sorry, my internet is really lagging today. And I can actually click, click straight through to the actual act, and then I can start to browse within it, where, of course, I'm starting to get my authoritative information. I go back to my practice note for a moment. You can also see other acts that are being considered. You'll also notice as we go through the practice notes, we've got these little orange speech marks on the side. And if I mouse over one of those, so I'm just gonna move all of you 
so I can see what I'm doing as well, you'll see that this actually will connect to a specific place in legislation or case law, or in this case, a government works a website that's useful. So even though the practice note itself is not authoritative, it's doing so much work for you in terms of linking to further documents. So I think it would be a very valid search to say, I went into Lexis PSL, I searched for my topic, I viewed the practice note, I went on to this or that document, which is authoritative, which I found there, and I'm using this bit for my answer. So you can see how that would break down in each and every part. So you can see, I can also then go into other summaries. So an overview of what protected characteristics are. And again, at every point, it's really trying to push me through finding everything that I could possibly want. You can also see, that I can then go here, I can look at all the documents in the subtopic. So I could here go to cases. So cases to do with disabilities are the first one that come out. And again, you can see that I've got clickable links here. So I don't have to just trust their summary of it. I can go and look at the authoritative. I can, there's a link straight away to find the judgment or I can just read the digest and what was going on here. So hopefully you can see that compared perhaps to Westlaw and Lexis Library itself, it's very focused on getting you to information really quickly at pointing you to everything you can want. Um, with all of these, you can print, you can download, you, you can photocopy. Uh, is there any questions about Lexis or Lexis PSL or how that works? Okay, I'll go back. I'll go back to my search again a minute. Okay. Um, the other thing you'll notice is this one. It's telling me is just in one practice area. If you see that there are things in two, you can actually use here to switch between them. Um, and again, you've got the news items here as well. It all depends exactly what you're looking for. So it is really useful at this point to take a moment and have a look at everything that's there, check through it all, you can go have a look at checklists and float and um, diagrams that are relevant, all of that. So any questions about anything to do with Lexis or Lexis PSL? Okay, I'm go back to my PowerPoint for a moment. Oh, come on. Sorry, my mouse has vanished completely. There we go. So, um, so the cautions with Lexis PSL, as I was saying, make sure you're checking the authorities. The practice notes are really good because they link so heavily and they can do a lot of your thinking for you but make sure you are interrogating them that you're thinking to and you're not just citing them uncritically. Um, we're coming towards the sort of midpoint, well over the midpoint of the hour. So I'm not gonna do demonstrations of this, but just a reminder, Westlaw itself is cases, journal articles, legislation books. It's still useful to search within Westlaw as well as Lexis Library or Lexis PSL. Um, the advantage of Lexington Library would be for consulting things like Hall Halsbury's Laws. You can see it's really well linked from PSL and it's a really good idea to try PSL out. Um, if you are on campus, there are the paper versions of the law reports and legislations in the library. Uh, Michael does really like you guys to go and have a look and practice the skills there, but I would say there are cautions. Firstly, the COVID restrictions. Also, they're not being so consistently updated anymore. So go have a look at them, try the skill out, but it's worth double checking against Lexis or Westlaw to make sure they're fully up to date. Um, any questions about searching or finding information? Are you guys happy? If you are, I will head straight on to very quickly looking at referencing and then can let you guys go with some time back. So. The main things with referencing, make sure you are using the Oscular guide and you're following the Oscular style because that's expected in legal work. Um, you should be grouping your, your sources by type, so cases together, legislation together, statutory instruments together, secondary material together. Um, you should be noting whether they're online or paper. Again, that's something Michael's particularly interested in. 
and there is help in the library guides for Oscar. Have you all seen the library guides for Oscar before? Or been to any of the teaching sessions on Oscar? I'm gonna take that as a yes, but I will I will show it quickly at the end. Um, basically, that's everything I want to cover with you. I hope that you feel clear on why you might want to use Lexis PSL on what the research record should or could look like, what needs to be in it and its importance. If you need any help with any of this to do with research, to do with referencing, you can email us or you can go to the law guide. I'll very quickly um, change my share and highlight the Oscar guide. So if we come back to the subject guides, it's down under referencing an Oscar. Um, so it's going to take you through everything. So what quotations should be laid out like paraphrases, repeating citations, and that's just a case of selecting what your source is. So cases with a neutral citation, it will give you examples for the footnotes and um, for the bibliography. Um, thank you very much for your time. I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to stop